here with Dr. Matthew Lynch. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us today. Thanks, Jonathan, for having me. Could you maybe give us a bit of a, a background to your academic history uh, and how you got to where you are now? Sure. I um, was sort of hopping around majors when I was an undergrad and didn't really have a sense of where I wanted to focus. I you know, actually was interested in things like mountaineering and and like trying to come up with some sort of discipleship and mountaineering program like one I had experienced um, in, in Europe one summer. And, and then I did a semester abroad in Israel just because I wanted to get away and do something different. And it was during my time in Israel that I really caught the bug for biblical studies more formally, uh, academically. I was taking classes in intertestamental literature and the history and geography of the Bible at Jerusalem University College. I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with it. Um, and it was in the process of studying there that I thought, hey, I'd like to pursue this more rigorously. Um, and, and I was drawn to Old Testament through professors I had, but also out of a, a sense that the Old Testament was a neglected or underrated part of the canon, yeah. the Christian canon. Um, and a lot of potential there for the church and and uh, academically as well. So and it, anyway, I ended up pursuing grad studies at Regent where I, I now work. And um, in the process of that, wanted to go further in doctoral studies, went to Emory University in Atlanta and um, sort of continued the journey of like hopping around to like pursue different experiences in different countries. So I spent time in Germany and in Israel and eventually ended up working in the UK and now in Canada. So it's been a, a globe trotting endeavor, very exciting and fun, but uh, I hope to be settled now for a while. Uh, as you know, academia can be unsettling and, yep. and have you in this sort of semi-nomadic state for a long time. So I think like it, the it Israelites. Makes all of us, <laughs> yeah, it makes all of us sort of crave place and, and location and, and yep. semi-permanence at least. So that's where I'm at now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, that gives us a sense of how you got interested in the Old Testament. And I mean, being mm -hmm. in the Holy Land, that's that's a great yeah. way to start. What yeah. is the transition from uh, the Hebrew Bible in general to, mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to run head first at the mm -hmm. perhaps the hardest problem for biblical mm -hmm. apologetics. I'm going to run at the violent portrayal of God in the Hebrew Bible. What what drew yeah. you to that specific question and made you mm -hmm. think? I want to make my career out of wrestling with the unwrestlable. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully it's a segment of my career, but um, I, you know, it, it's one of those questions that. Oh yeah. I didn't um, mean to say that was your whole career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. one of those questions that has hung around like in the background of my mind as I've studied the old Testament. So it's, it's definitely just an ongoing part of, in, like deep engagement with scripture is that you encounter these challenging portraits of God. And, and as you're thinking as an academic and educator, you're also maybe like for me, at least par the parallel track is not only what do I think about this, but how do I teach this or talk about this in both in the church and in the classroom. And, and so it wasn't just a matter of like, this is my, this is, my the, a relentless question for me that I must chase down to the bitter end. Um, but it was a question of mine, but also came up in the classroom a lot. Um, and also I, I put, I talk about in the book how, um, you know, when I was in Israel, it, I had certain experiences there of seeing kind of issues of injustice and, and wanting to think uh, like as a Christian about violence and, um, and politics. Mm. And then when I was studying at Regent, the Iraq invasion was ongoing or had just, um, you know, begun. And I was studying the book of Joshua. And so you can't study Joshua while the Iraq invasion is happening and not at least think about the resonance between the two. And, yeah. and what do we do with the text? What do we do in contemporary society? And so that was like the lively conversation in the atrium of Regent. And and then when I taught 
uh, in England. Um, you know, I was teaching students who were wondering about these things too in, in different contexts. So it just came up time and again. And um, But I, as I started putting thoughts to paper or thoughts to classroom notes, I felt like there were certain gaps that needed addressing prior to asking the question, what do we as Christians do about violence in the Bible? Um, and that prior question is my earlier book, which is portraying violence in the Hebrew Bible. And, and it was a, a matter of, well, how does the Bible itself, how does the Old Testament itself think about violence when it's thinking about it as a problem? How does it represent that problem? And like to ask the question most basically, what's wrong with violence? Um, and the Old Testament has its own ways of thinking about that, that are um, overlapping with contemporary concerns, but also has some sort of fresh things to offer. So I wanted to kind of work on that ground up question. And then this most recent book is a more top down question of how do we as Christians then respond to violence in the text in a way that's sensitive to the text um, and pastorally uh, helpful. So, so that that's sort of how I've progressed in in this question. I don't know how much, um, like there there are a lot of further questions I have to like think about and think through. But um, that's that's where I've gotten so far. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's dive into it. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the main ways Christians have tried to resolve these issues of violence in the mm -hmm. Hebrew Bible? Um, Give us maybe just sort of a survey of the traditional responses before we jump into your yeah. unique way of responding in Flood and Fury. Sure. I, uh, yeah, I outlined some of these and I, I, I won't list them all. Um, and I'm drawing, I'm adapting a list from Roger Olson, who had written um, uh, a really helpful blog post, if anyone wants to look it up, called Every Known Theistic Approach to Old Testament Texts of Terror, I think is the name of it. Um, and I, I sort of worked with that and, and developed it, um, but with his permission. And uh, um, so you have like the extreme version of a Marcionite response, which is, you know, Marcion was an early church heretic who wanted to dispense with the Old Testament, not simply because of the problem of violence, but that was a, a, a factor in that it represented a God of wrath. And, and Marcion thought that was unbecoming of the God of um uh, of Jesus. Um, and, and so Marcion's solution was to get rid of the Old Testament and in the process, a good chunk of the New as well, because you can't get rid of the Old Testament, and not cut out a bunch of the New Testament. So yep. you, you end up so that the, if you do a sort of cost benefit analysis, you get rid of the problem of violence, but you also get rid of most of the Bible in the process in and as different early church fathers responded to Marcion, you, you also get rid of divine justice in the process too. So there, there are hidden costs that have to be considered there. So that's been repudiated by the church rightly. Um, and then there are more orthodox approaches that vary pretty widely. So you have um, Augustine, um, and, and Calvin as the chief representatives of divine command theory, which is the idea that if God commands it, it's by definition just. And, hmm. and so if God commands people, Israel to slaughter men, women, and children, then it must be just. And who of us deserves life anyway? So that's the, the kind of idea there. Um, but even adherents of divine command theory also slide in further apologetic um, sort of foundations to that idea. So it never really <laughs> stands on its own as a total solution um, hmm. because this, they're saying things like, well, those people would have gone on to maybe, um, you know, live, uh, you know, more horrible lives anyway, or, you know, it's a mercy to those children because they would have grown up in this, <laughs> horrific society. Um, yeah. And what, what that theory is trying to protect is the idea that God is, is beholden by some higher standard than himself, right? Like this, this super category of justice to which God is, is beholden and in a sense subservient to. So that's what that view is trying to protect. So we, I think we can appreciate 
what it's trying to do without sort of going with the theory 100%. Then there are different ideas like progressive revelation, which is that our under, humans understanding of, of God progresses over time. And we see that in scripture. So you get a fuller, more complete revelation of God as you move from the Old Testament to the new, which I think has serious problems with it as well, that there's a kind of linear progression um, because, you know, the, the claim that humans are made in the image of God is on first the first chapter of the bible we don't really progress beyond that so uh, um you don't get much much higher of an anthropology as you get to malachi right yeah humans Um, probably just degress we probably just get worse (laughs) exactly and and the sort of underlying theology of anthropology is not updated radically from that um yeah so So, yeah, there are problems with progressive revelation. There are different versions of that that I talk about. Then there's a more Christocentric or even a Crucicentric view, which a representative would be Greg Boyd, um, who says the fullest and most complete revelation of God that we have in the Bible is on the cross. And so really he uses the cross as a hermeneutical lens for reinterpreting other texts in the Bible to read them until they look like the cross. So the, mm. the, it's not actually a hermeneutic. It's just a, um, it, it's almost like a, you're overwhelming other texts with the cross view of enemy love, self-sacrifice, and you're rereading texts and sort of running them through this grid until you, you yield that result. So your result is already guaranteed as you go to read a text. So to me, that's not actually a hermeneutic, um, unless it's or it's a very strong one (laughs) yeah (laughs) um and and then uh, i talk about mystery the mystery of it all which is that you have violent portraits of god in the bible you have love your enemy portraits of god and who are we to be able to reconcile all of that so we have to sort of sit with the tension and mystery of that um and not seek to resolve it so um you know as you read as you kind of think through those different approaches, there are more as well. Um, it, it's it's a useful exercise to just think about like, well, which, where do I sit? Um, what combination of those do I lean toward? Uh, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a helpful exercise. And I hope people can kind of do that as they begin, you know, thinking about this question. Another one I've heard a lot about is sort of an allegorical interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you mind maybe yeah. just discussing that for just a quick yeah, a sure. second or two? Yeah, so, you know, prime representative there would be Origen in the early church, but others as well, Cassian. Um, and and that's basically that stories like the slaughtering of the Canaanites and Joshua are to be read in light of the cross, but in, this, in the sense of like in light of the Christian life with the question front and center, what does this contribute to... Um, what do these characters in the story represent? And so Origen says that the seven Canaanite nations that Israel was to destroy represent like seven vices um, or deadly sins. And so, you know, greed, idolatry, and so on, these are lust. These are the things that must be put to death in us. And so as we read them, it's not a flesh and blood battle that we apply it to but rather to those vices and whatnot now the one of the problems with that is that you know at one level that's what a lot of us do in our preaching anyway right we you know yep. who's the canaanite in your life that <laughs> needs to <laughs> to see the end of a sword um but on yep. the other hand origin um he believed that the conquest happened historically and that mm-hmm. God commanded it. So it's not like his question was more about how do we appropriate it for today. So so as moderns thinking who are very concerned about history, it doesn't actually, at least classically expressed, the allegorical approach to the text doesn't resolve the problem of, well, did God ever command this to happen? And if he did, do I want anything to do with that God? Right. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the weaknesses of at least how it's been classically expressed. Well, thank you for that very helpful overview. Now that we've kind of seen some of the traditional ways Christians have tried to approach this, Mm -hmm. could you maybe help us understand 
uh, how your approach in Flood and Fury, the book mm -hmm. that you've just had come out, uh, which I recommend, go check it out, everyone. It's excellent. How does your approach in Flood and Fury differ from that or situate yeah. itself in relation to those yeah. historical answers we've given? Yeah, so one of the things I talk about in the introduction is that um, a method or approach only gets you so far with this question. Um, when you're dealing with the Old Testament or really with biblical interpretation in general. Um, and, and so part of my argument is that like for my personal approach to the, the question, I, I don't say like all those other views are invalid. Now I'm going to, you know, in the history of Christianity, now I'm going to give you one that sort of unlocks the whole question um, because I'm, I'm a kind of combination of those. Um, you know, I, I, there are aspects of progressive revelation that I uh, appeal to. There are um, aspects of the sort of mystery of it all that I appeal to, the Christological approach that I find compelling, but not one on its own. But but really, I think I think the key point I want to emphasize in this is is that an approach kind of gets you maybe oriented to the terrain. But then you need, need the sort of in the field navigational experience and, and wisdom that only comes by close exegesis and wrestling with specifics of the text. And so if, if I have a sort of method, it's slow it down, read it carefully, let the complexity of the text speak to this question. And when you do, there are all kinds of surprises along the way, um, because one of the one of the issues in taking a, an approach driven stance toward the problem of violence is that it's easy to sort of read the book of Joshua. OK, yeah, yeah. Israel goes in and slaughters a bunch of Canaanites. What are we going to do about that now? And have all of this sophistication sit on the side of the method to deal with a problem that you have caricatured. And, and so I want to read the text really carefully and let its nuances um, uh, to, to develop a response that accounts for the fullest array of the complexities of the text that we can. So that's, that's how I approach the problem. Um, and then there are other aspects to my, my uh, approach that, that have to do with thinking through then how this problem sits in relation to the central question that I think is at the heart of this, which is like, what is the character of God like? And can we trust this God? Like divine goodness is always there in the background. Um, and whether, whether God can be fundamentally trusted. And so, so keeping like character questions in, um, in, in the background and then bringing it into the foreground and conclusion, um, but also dealing with that sort of textual terrain in a way mm -hmm. that's sophisticated, but but also hopefully for readers accessible as well. So Sunday school coloring books and Russell Crowe movies aren't sufficient <laughs> for engaging with Noah's uh, flood. Yeah, we we actually yeah. have to sit with the text, get into the Hebrew, soak it in. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's let's do that then. You you yeah. really emphasize sitting with the texts and letting them be what they are, even if it scares mm -hmm. us. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we don't have time to fully do that here. Mm -hmm. But could you perhaps give us a taste? Could you maybe walk mm -hmm. us through the flood story a bit and help us sit in it for a while before yeah. we actually move on to trying to address it? Like bring us into the story. Sure. So. Um, so I talk about how like a standard approach to the flood story is basically humans were really bad. God got mad and God ruined everything. And and the problem with that approach is that B and C in that little syllogism are are inaccurate. Um, divine, the, so God got mad. There's no reference to divine wrath or anger in the whole story. And the only emotion attributed to God is grief. Um, sure. He was sorry that he had made humankind and that had, had come to this. And he was pained to his heart. So that's what it says of God. Um, and that God ruined everything. 
is also not fully accurate. You know, there's something to that. But um, in the lead up to the flood story in, in Genesis 6, like it, it talks about um, in, in like 6, 11, and 12, how um, there's this key moment where God looks at creation. And in the Hebrew, it's the sequence is identical to Genesis 1, 31, where it says God looked at, the, at all he had made and behold, it was very good. So you have looking, um, behold, clause, and then an assessment, it was very good. And in Genesis 6, uh, 12 or 11 or 12, it says, God looked and behold, it was, the earth was ruined. And, and so this is prior to the flood and it was, it was destroyed. And so then you have to ask yourself a question like, what destroyed the earth? What does it mean to say that the earth was already ruined prior to the flood? And the chief agent in, the, in that account is violence. Violence had filled the earth and ruined it. And it, Genesis 6 describes this sort of creation consuming violence that, you know, eats everything, um, where, where uh, all of creation is caught up in this cycle of violence. And so then what God does in response to that is he says, therefore, I will ruin the earth. And which sounds paradoxical, like, how do you ruin an earth that's already ruined? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think I use a, a metaphor or a, an image to try to interpret what's happening here uh, of like a potter at a wheel who is spinning clay. And if you're if you've ever spun spun clay before on a wheel like if you if you look down at that and you see that it's got all these air bubbles and it's it's got holes in it you can't patch it and then stick it in the kiln and it'll explode right so it's it's ruined and so what you have to do with that ruined clay is do a different kind of ruining which is you turn it back to a ball in order to remake it right so if you want to yeah. if you want to in fact create that mug that you're going to make for your pottery class. Um, you have to return it back to useful formlessness. And, and I think that's what the flood story is describing God's ruining uh, as doing. It's, it's returning creation back to the, the uh, watery formlessness with which it began in order to then send his ruach or breath over the water again as in Gen oh. Genesis 8, 1, to begin the process of creating dry land and reforming it with Noah's family. Now, that doesn't get rid of the violence of this story, um, but I think that's how Genesis wants us to think about divine action in the story. And I think there's also an important piece of this is Israel retelling familiar ancient Near Eastern flood stories that are circulating around floating around the ancient world. And, and, um, and to that extent, they, um, the question wasn't whether they would tell a flood story, but how they were going to tell it. And so they retold this popular myth within a, a Yahwistic framework in order to capture the truth of who Yahweh was and what the world was like. So, know, so all that, these other, sorry. So yep. there's all these other flood narratives going on mm -hmm. where God is this violent actor. And what's different yep. about this is we told the same story that everyone else was telling. But yeah. in this, God's violence, if you want to say, is directed at violence itself. Yeah. So what's, what's significant about the story mm -hmm. is not that God's violent, because that's in all the stories. It's, mm -hmm. it's how the flood story is different from all of the other ones at the time. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, in the, in the, other flood stories you have a you have in a polytheistic framework you have the advantage of having a an antagonist and protagonist god one who sends a flood and one who preserves the the hero in the ark um mm. but in the genesis flood story yahweh is the protagonist and the antagonist is violence and so mm. not another deity but violence and, and I think that's a sort of unique telling. And it doesn't describe Yahweh's action as violence per se, but as that sort of precondition for um, reforming and recreating the world. Again, that doesn't resolve all the issues, but I think 
it situates us in relation to the text better in like in terms of getting us at uh, getting at what the text itself wants to communicate yeah well thank you for that very helpful uh wading in to the story <laughs> i'm trying to use this you you used yeah, floating earlier yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying yeah. to focus on the nautical water-based types yes. of things yeah that's good um well thank you for that kind of overview are there any other helpful things when it comes to specifically the noah story that we should be paying attention to 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 ease some of these tensions mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, like I said, the the, the history I have, I think, is important that that this is taking a popular story, at least in my understanding, um, and not a historical claim per se. Um, also, the Genesis nine is an interesting uh, chapter in that it, it the post flood arrangement between God, humanity, and creation seems to address the problem of violence very specifically in that it prohibits um, taking of life. It um, God makes a covenant with creation never again to let flood floods ruin it. Um, and that's not just a claim about like God is preserving, you know, fire, earthquake, volcanoes, all these other options. It's like to say he's not going to flood again means he's never going to let it return to formlessness. Huh. Um, and, and so, and, and he also makes what I call a strategic arms reduction treaty. And, and you know, he, um, he makes this covenant between himself and creation to, to not only not ruin it, but also to promote its flourishing. And, and so there are like at least three direct responses to the creation destroying problem of violence that we see detailed in the story that emerges in the post-flood account. And so really the whole thing from beginning to end is, is dealing with the problem of violence head on. And so this story that is, you know, for many of us really troubling or problematic because of its violence is addressing violence uh -huh. uh, in, at least if you get inside its own logic and go with it in the terms that I think it wants to be understood. Yeah. Well, let's try uh, to dive into another one of the, uh, we only got an hour, so we got to shove all of these atrocities in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did God command genocide in the book of Joshua? And hmm. what things have you found helpful in coming to grips with that conquest narrative? Yeah. Um, well, as, as you might expect, like my, my response is, not really. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, okay. If you, the place where it seems like God does most clearly is Deuteronomy 7. That's like the, the most challenging text when it comes to the Canaanite conquest, um, if we want to call it that. And that's in Deuteronomy 7, that's where God says you're to go in and wipe out, utterly destroy these seven Canaanite nations, leave nothing alive that breathes, and just to sort of emphasize the point, show them no mercy. So, so Deuteronomy 7 is one of those texts that really takes your breath away when you read it, because not only are you destroying everything, men, women, children, and animals, by the way, um, which, you know, at that level, you're like, what did they do? Um, <laughs> and, yeah. um, but also like to withhold mercy seems so contrary to the character of God. I mean, that's one of the core aspects, like aspects of God's character revealed across the canon. And so, um, so that's like, that's the sort of ground zero for the problem. Um, and then Joshua, the book of Joshua, seems to show Israel implementing that with regard to Jericho, and then in modified form in regard to some other cities as well. So you have both command and implementation, and uh -huh. and that's that's a challenging reality. So so what I did in thinking about this problem is is to say. Like, and this is where I sort of put on my Christological hat 
in thinking about this is how is it that these texts are formative for Jesus? You know, that the Hebrew Bible is the formative curriculum for for Jesus in his growing up years. Like he was immersed in this and it comes out in his teachings that he had great facility with scripture. And, and so how is it that the Old Testament leads to someone who teaches and lives like Christ? And there must be something here. Now, I can't always point to an exact text and say, here's the arrow pointing to Jesus directly, right? Like it's not, I don't think that's how you do Christological readings of the Old Testament, um, unless you want to really butcher the text. Um, but it makes me go back to texts like Deuteronomy 7. So just as an example there, in, in Deuteronomy 7, it, it after saying to do all that stuff to the Canaanites, it, it says, um, don't intermarry with them and um, tear down all their altars, smash their pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, all that stuff. So, so right there you have an issue of like, how do you not inter, how do you avoid intermarriage with people that are wiped out, right? So it's assuming that they're going to be around to intermarry with potentially. And that fits the history of Israel and the Canaanites, right? So that's at that level, then you're thinking, okay, maybe this is a piece of rhetoric as a lot of interpreters have understood Deuteronomy to be. Um, huh. And it, and it also, and also there's a key phrase in that passage and it says, this is how you are to deal with them, namely the Canaanites. And it goes on to say, smash their pillars and their altars and all of that as if, as if the way you destroy the Canaanites is by getting rid of their religious paraphernalia and, um, you know, rendering their, um, altars unusable. So, um, so there, there's the rereading of that text itself, and there's actually a lot more to that particular passage um, that commends that sort of spiritualizing rereading already at work in that text. Um, also bearing in mind that this is a story written down for a people who likely were in exile or post-exilic. And so the Joshua through Kings is the Deuteronomistic history, this chunk of narrative that runs from Joshua through Kings and was edited during the exile, reached his final form probably during that time or post-exile. So this is written for a people, you know, for whom there are no more Canaanites. Um, so how are they supposed to appropriate this text? That's also a key question. Um, and this... Yeah. And this, I mean, this is also a community that's been disenfranchised, that's been yeah. had Babylon invade, that's had yeah. themselves forcibly relocated hundreds mm -hmm. and hundreds of miles and have had yeah. loss after loss after loss. And so I guess to, to imagine it in that context is almost like, well, the Bible's giving them a victory, uh, a mythology yeah. of their people that they can look to where they mm -hmm. they almost win in the context of yeah. constantly losing by being defeated yeah. by Assyria, you know, Babylon, all of these things. I right. mean, it's sort of like what Quentin Tarantino does in Inglorious Bastards, where he has mm -hmm. the Jews kill mm -hmm. Hitler, or yeah. in Django Unchained, where he has the slave destroy the plantation. It's, mm. it's violence, yeah. and none of us would actually yeah. agree with it. But in light of right. the history of violence, the other direction, it almost feels justifiable as, yeah. as a narrative for a suffering people. Yeah, Is and that... it's interesting, too. Yeah. And, and, you know, historically speaking, too, there's a there's an anti-imperial piece to this as well in that, you know, when Israel went into the land of Canaan, uh, Egypt still had its grip on this region via a, a sort of network of petty Canaanite kings. And so mm. it's easy for us to read the story because it doesn't really talk about Egypt and, and lose sight of that historical reality that that Canaan was in a sense like a outpost of Egypt it wasn't directly kind of controlled uh, by Egypt but it was managed by them and we have all sorts of correspondence between 
Canaanite rulers in Egypt, you know, at them asking for more weapons and more supplies and to deal with their disputes between these different regions and to deal with these problem of invading, um, you know, warlords who are coming in and trying to uh, upset the power balance. So, so when Israel goes and fights their battles, it's interesting that most of the battles are against walled cities with kings. Um, and, and that's a kind of breaking the Egyptian power hold on this region and to get a foothold in the land. So, so it's easy for us to think of like these, you know, these sort of peace loving people who Israel just invades and it's anything but that. Um, yeah. And that's why I actually call in the book uh, the 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 conquest really Exodus part two um, mm. coming out. There's violence to this story for sure, just like there was in the Exodus. But it's of the Exodus variety when understood politically, and that's, I think that's significant. Yeah. They don't attack unwalled cities. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, that's. Mm. I mean, I guess. Would you say that we tend to reread these ancient Jewish texts in light of Christian history and Christian empire? Yeah. And yeah. the and we have this power dynamic where, well, the Christians were the power oppressing the yeah. poor. Um, but yeah. don't read that back onto an ancient Jewish text because these right. are slaves who have mm -hmm. fled for their lives through the desert. Mm -hmm. And they're not just going and stealing land from these innocent people. Mm -hmm. This is still mm -hmm. part of Egypt. This is an extension yeah. of the Egyptian empire yeah. in Canaan, yeah. and they're still fighting for their survival and to yeah. to kind of have a – they're not just trying to, mm -hmm. hey, we need a place of our own. They're still mm -hmm. fleeing the empire, yeah. and like that's it, – it, the power yeah. dynamic here yeah. is exactly. it's essential to flip it and not read Christian history and Christendom yeah. and Christian empire back into an ancient exactly. Jewish text. Yeah, because, you know, I'll often hear the criticism that this text needs to be resisted because it's been used to justify, say, the um, expulsion of Native Americans um, or any other kinds of conquests that it's been used to legitimate. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's a that's a misuse of the text and it's an unfortunate injustice that's been perpetrated with, you know, this text in hand. But let's reread the text because we're, we're not going to um, let's think about it historically and what kind of literature this is. Cause it's, you know, in its first instance, historically speaking, part of this fleeing, um, you know, Hebrew uh, formerly enslaved people and in its appropriation in the post-exilic period, it's by a people who are without power on the bottom of society. And so, um, yeah, we can't sort of read our own power into the text and out of the sort of shame over our own history, then project that onto the Israelites. Yeah. So you end up admitting at the near the end of the book that a lot of this stuff is irresolvable. Can mm -hmm. you talk a bit about that irresolvability and sitting with those tensions and confusions and what what? that's been like for you personally, faith wise, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, one of the terms that I found helpful for thinking about the problem of violence is the idea that, that the ethics of violence in scripture is a kind of wicked problem. And, and so wicked problems are problems like the problem of poverty that where there's no agreement on the definition of the problem itself, right? So what exactly constitutes poverty? Um, is it, um, you know, income inequality? Is it, is it when you don't have education? Is it when you don't have a certain income? Is it, is it just when you don't have a roof over your head and enough food? Um, and there's no agreement on the solutions to the problem how exactly we should tackle it politically, spiritually, economically, socially, and when you've arrived at a solution. How would you know when you've solved poverty? <laughs> um, and so it's similar with the problem of violence. So it's irresolvable in the sense that like resolution is only in relation to some criteria that constitutes 
it being resolved. And I know from experience, um, this is a more anecdotal point, but that um, any sort of explanations and wrestlings that I can offer do not eliminate the problem for people. Um, it still lingers, right? So to that extent, there's always a lingering something um, that, that sits there with us as we look at this problem. But the fact that it can't be resolved doesn't mean we don't work at it. So you can't, you can't solve the problem of poverty, but that you don't throw up our hands and say, well, let's not bother then. Um, what's the point? Um, we'll never find, we'll never get rid of it completely. There are other kinds of goals along the way. And I think that's what's been important to me in my own journey with this is that realizing that some of those, some of those ancillary or seemingly ancillary goals are actually more central to this than the goal of resolving the, the tension or the dilemma, uh, the ethical dilemma. Um, and some of those goals are things like, or re results, I should say, are things like finding that there are other people, other Christians to journey with, holding on to faith in working through this problem. It's a kind of like discipleship walk that you're going along other people, finding other like-minded people in the way. Um, finding that these texts that I thought were straightforwardly problematic and, and awful are more wonderful than I ever imagined. Um, and, and so, so those other goals end up playing a key role in this journey with violence in scripture. And I think that's my sort of encouragement to people is that like, don't ignore those, those seemingly kind of side, um, results of studying this problem, because sometimes you you head out to like solve a particular dilemma and then you realize along the way that your goals have changed um that you're not trying to just erase all the tension anymore you've learned to live with it right you've learned to live with some of the mystery of this question but you've also discovered something of the goodness of god in the way along the way and to me that's been my journey is is finding a sort of deeper and more wonderful understanding of God while wrestling with this problem of violence that I haven't resolved and I don't think anyone can. And in fact, I think there are real hidden consequences, unintended consequences to resolving it completely that we should be wary of. You know, there's there's fine print you should read and on any book that claims to get rid of this problem completely. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, let me know when you need to go because I'll just keep asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine okay well we often stand over the hebrew bible and <clears throat> ancient jewish culture in judgment mm -hmm. but how might it judge us what ways mm -hmm. do our critiques reveal our specific cultural and uh, our specific culture and time and assumptions mm -hmm. yeah it, that's a great question um I think there are a lot of ways um, that we have to sort of step outside of our ourselves and try to to let the text read us and to also let other interpreters challenge us. So for one thing, it's been challenging to think with Christians in other parts of the world that, that do face more violence than I've encountered uh, on a regular basis and maybe on a national level to hear how do they read these violent texts. Um, some of them have the same kind of wrestlings and dilemmas, and some of them find them actually very hopeful uh, that God is not um, silent with regard to uh, oppressive forces in the world, or, or God does hold people to account. Um, and then there are ways that the I think the Old Testament actually has a more robust understanding of the problem itself than we do. So one of the things that emerges in Genesis, early on in Genesis, is that violence is a, is a creation-destroying force. And so, and, and it understands that violence against, human-on-human uh, -human violence ruins the land. There's some kind of mystical connection between what I do to another person in the condition of the land. And I think 
you know, in light of the ecological crisis we're in, I think like if you could ask the ancient Israelites to write a book on the problem of modern violence, they would just shake their heads at how blind we are to the, the, the land crying out because of our, the violent, the blood we've shed. And so I think they would, they would just, they wouldn't know what to do with that. Um, that would be the sort of huge problem of violence that they would all be trying to wrestle with. So I think there's a, a way that we can hear the Old Testament sort of ecological understanding of violence and say, whoa, maybe the problem's much bigger than I realized. It's not just a sort of personal or structural social problem, but it's, it's ecocidal, even in ways that I can't even detect, you know, not just sort of dumping chemicals into a river or carbon into the atmosphere, but but there's something deeper connecting humans to the land that's being broken every time we hurt another person. And, and I think the old Testament's sensitive to that reality. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. I, I mean, in light of the fact that humans are very much on the precipice of our existence, threatening the entire planet yeah. and all of the ecosystems yeah. of the world, yeah. perhaps the question for the Noah story isn't why did God destroy almost everyone, but why mm -hmm. did he let Noah's family live and give humanity yeah. another try? Uh, because yeah. creation yeah. really might have been better off without us. Yeah. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review. We're an up-and-coming podcast, and every little bit helps. Also consider joining our Patreon page. Patreon sponsors have exclusive access to unaired episodes, different kinds of merchandise, the ability to suggest an episode, and even an hour-long interview with Jonathan and I. Check it out at spirituallyincorrectpodcast.com and see what you're missing out on. Sound effects from zapsplat.com. Special thanks to Jordan Birch whose song Starry Night provides the intro and outro for this podcast. You can hear more of his music on YouTube or Spotify.